2 Samuel chapter 6, if you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to join along as we make our way through the life of David. Very interesting uh, situation that, that we come upon in chapter 6. Remember, David has now uh, unified the nation. It's no longer a divided nation. It wasn't, uh, you know, David and Saul, uh, both uh, David's dynasty and in, in, in his family against Saul and, and his dynasty and his family. Now, they've been united. David's now the king of Israel. And his desire was to uh, not only deal with the political life of the nation, but wanting now to deal with the spiritual life of the nation. And so David is going to attempt now to build God a, a tabernacle, to bring the Ark of the Covenant from uh, it, its, it, its current location and bring it into Jerusalem, or also, or, or known as also the city of David. You know, they're kind of parallel, right next to each other. And so he's he's now looking to um, really establish his reign and establish the spiritual life of, of the nation. And it's it's incredible because you know we we learn so much from the things that David did, I think so applicable to our own lives. There's a lesson here. There's a lesson that, that I, I think is so um, important for every one of us to learn. And, and you, you get to learn it from an example of someone who, you know, there's no one who can question David's heart. David was a man after God's own heart. And, you know, the, you, so you come to David, and you kind of look, here, here's a guy who really had the right intentions. Here's a guy who had all the right motives in what he was doing. As he becomes the king, wanting to put God first, wanting God to be at the center of, of their city, the center of their nation. And we come to this, to this passage. Now, his attempt now is to take the Ark of the Covenant and to bring it into uh, a, a final place of resting. And I, I think it's important for us to just have a little bit of background on, on what the Ark of the Covenant meant. Remember when Moses had taken the children of Israel out of Egypt. They had wandered in the desert. And God gave Moses instructions on how this Ark was to be designed. And then how it was to be built all the material that was to be used in order to build this ark and it was to be a picture or a a, a, a visible display of God's presence that, that's what the ark of the covenant was all about inside of the ark there would be the tablets the two tablets that Moses received from the Lord up on the mountain and then there would be in there Aaron's rod Aaron's rod that had budded right and 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 then on there, in there would also have been a jar of manna that would have been closed and sealed as a remembrance of God's provision for the children of Israel while they were wandering in the desert for 40 years. And so as all of these things, you know, had such great representation, but it, more so than that was this ark represented God, God's power, God's presence, God's might. And so David's intention here was, you know, to bring this, this, incredible artifact this 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 presence of god now into the temple now look look what happens in chapter six that let's let's go through this passage it says and again david gathered all the choice men of israel thirty thousand of them and he arose and he went with all the people who were with him from baal judah to bring up from there the ark of god whose Name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Now, the cherubim were the two angels in between that, that faced both sides of the ark. And so God's dwelling, God's presence there. Now, it's interesting that 2 Samuel gives us a very short glimpse of this story. If you go to 1 Chronicles, and I want to ask you to turn there, but we'll kind of go back and forth a little bit. 1 Chronicles chapter 13. You, we, we have a little more insight into this event and these things in, in First Chronicles. Uh, there in chapter 13, um, we find out a little more about the meeting that David had and, and what had transpired as a result of it. Look, look what it says in chapter 13. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds 
and with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, if it is of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in the land of Israel and with them to the priests and Levites who are in the cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us and let us bring the ark of our God back to us for we have not inquired at it since the, day of, the days of Saul. And all the assembly said that they would do so for the thing was right, check this out, in the eyes of all the people. You, you see, David was taking a consensus. He was saying, hey, what do you guys think? Is this a good idea? Should we bring the ark, you know, from its, its location, you know, into uh, Jerusalem? Is, does that seem good to you? Does that seem right to you? And I, I think there's, there's something that David begins to kind of veer away from. And, and one of the things that you notice as you look at that passage is that David never prayed. He never sought God's counsel, God's wisdom. Every time you go to a battle at this point, he's saying, God, do we go or don't we, do, do we not go? God, how are we to fight this battle? He's seeking God for everything, but in this instance, he doesn't. And because of it, there's going to be a great catastrophe that's going to take place. No, notice, notice what happens there in verse 3. Back in chapter 6. We're, we're, we'll, go keep, we'll, we'll go back to 1 Chronicles again. But look, look at verse 3 of chapter 6, 2 Samuel. So they set the ark of God on a new cart. They brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. You think, well, well that, that, that sounds like a good idea. They, they put it on a, on a new card. I mean, this thing had never been used. It was, it was you know, something to, to behold. You know, it's one thing to have an old card, but now they built a new card for this very purpose. And, and now we're going to take the ark of God, the ark of, of the Lord of hosts, and we're going to place it upon this new card. And as we place it upon the new card, we're going to have these two brothers Abinadab's sons. Now, Abinadab, we found him in 1 Samuel. Uh, it's, it's when um, the children of Israel had been defeated by the Philistines. They had taken the ark. And the, the, the Philistines had the, the ark in their city and everyone started to break out in tumors. And so they send it to the next city and then they break out in tumors. They send it to the next city and finally they take the ark, they put it on a cart and they send it back to Israel. And, and here, here's what's interesting on this. God had never instructed them to put the ark on a cart. That's what the Philistines did. That's, that, that's how the world dealt with God's stuff. It, it wasn't how God instructed his people to deal with his stuff. And, and what, what's incredible is how many times, and I think here's the lesson for us, is, is that we, we think we, we're going to do God's business, we're going to do God's things, but we're going to do it our way rather than God's way. We, we have good intention. We have good motives. We got, we got you know, the right uh, desire here, but we decide we're going to do it a whole different way rather than how God prescribes to do it. And I think what, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for failure because you have to worship God the way he prescribes us to worship. You can't make it up along the way. You have to come to God according to his purpose, his plan, the way he declares. Not, however, I, I, I can't make God according to my own image or to my own wants or to my own way. And so they decide, you know, we're going to get a cart. Just like the Philistines, we'll get a cart. And then not only we get a cart, we're going to drive it. You know, you don't, don't ever try to drive the Lord. Not a good idea. You're going to, you know, pushing them the way you want them to go. Lord, this is what I'm going to do. Would you bless it? I mean, how many times we pray that prayer? Well, this is my plan. Well, you know, would you help it? <laughs> Rather than say, God, what's your plan? 
What's your, what's your way? What is it that you desire? And, and what, what's interesting is that these brothers are now walking along the cart. One of them's in the driver's seat. The other one is kind of walking behind the cart. And the one's name is Uzzah. Then others, Ohio. The, the interesting thing is Ohuza means strength. Strength. And any, any time you're going to try to do something in your own strength, your own wisdom, your own power, your own ability. You know, I'm, I'm going to do this, but, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to ask God's counsel here. I'm not going to do it God the way God desires me to do it. I'm going to do it my way because, you know, I got it, I got it taken care of. The name of the other brother was Ohio, which means brotherly, friendly, kind of, you know, it, it's the whole idea that, you know, that, that this is the guy who, who just has a, a, a welcoming, uh, you know, appearance every time, every time you greet him. And that, that's the picture here. And, and you got these two brothers and, and one strength, the other one friendly. And, and how, how, how is it that, you know, we think we can, we can go and do God's things according to our own strength or just by, you know, being friendly? There's this whole movement in the church, you know, seeker sensitive. You, you know, you just want to be, if you're just friendly, then people will, will get saved. If you're just friendly, then you're going to attract the world. I mean, we need to be friendly, but that's not the formula. That's, that, that's not how God operates. You see, God wants to change the heart of a person. He wants to change the direction, the life of a person. And, and what's incredible is these two guys are going to try to drive the Lord to the desired place. And it doesn't turn out so good. Watch, watch, watch what happens. Look at verse 4. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ohio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, of harps and stringed instruments and tambourines and sistrums and on cymbals. And when they had come to Nechen's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and he took hold of it for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and he struck him there for his error and he died there by the ark of God. Wow. As there, there's a dilemma here. Because I, I don't believe any one of these guys has ill intent. I, I think every one of them you know, had, had a, a right uh, desire in this case, and they go, well, what, what, what's up with that? They're trying to get the ark. It, it was, it was, it was, it was something that was a good, a good thing. And they put it on this cart, and they start to take it to the city of David. And you come back, and you go, wait, wait, wait a second, what happened? And it's an interesting Proverbs, Proverbs fourteen twelve. It says this. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. And in other words, what, 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 the, what the Proverbs declare is, look, it doesn't matter what you think is right. What does God declare to be right? Because if you're going to go according to what you think is right, you, you have the, the, the capacity to be wrong. But if you take God's word and God's truth and say, you know what, that's what's right. That's what I'm going to follow. Then you can't err. And that's exactly what happened to Uzzah. He erred. He did, he did something that was, that was outside of God's plan, outside of God's design. You know, it's just a small thing, right? It's, well, what, why would God strike him dead? Turn to Numbers chapter 4, backwards in your Bible. This, this is the law being given to Moses. Numbers chapter 4, beginning in the 15th verse. Here, here it is, and it's, it's as plain as, as it gets. Watch this. And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Korath 
shall come to carry them, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These are the things in the tabernacle of meeting which the sons of Korth are to carry. You see, God had warned them. You, you, you touch the holy things, you're going to die. And you know what's interesting? For 40 years, they carry the ark on their shoulder. For 40 years, they wandered in the desert. And no one died from touching the ark. And here they are in, in you know, a short distance in one day, here you had Uzzah who dies as a result of touching the ark because they didn't do it according to God's plan. And it's interesting, it says it was the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah because God's, you know, the, the, the ark was, was to be a holy instrument. It was to be a set apart instrument. And now in his own strength, he's going to try to hold it up when the ox trips, you know, and, 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 and in, in essence, he's, he's saying, you know, I, I'm the one who needs to rescue, you know, this situation rather than trust the Lord, rather than do it God's way, rather than doing how God prescribed it to be done. And I, I think it should cause all of us to have the same response that King David has here. No, notice what happens in, in, in verse 7. Well, at least part of his response. Look what it says in verse 7. It says, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah. I'm sorry, verse 8. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of that place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? But what an interesting response from King David. He was angry. You see, David had this incredible plan. David had, you know, he was going to unify the nation. He was going to bring everyone under God's, you know, rule, under God's authority. And, and, and he, it was to be a theocracy. It was supposed to be God, the one leading the nation. And then, and then David, his representative, and they were to, you know, go out and, you know, fight the battles and, and live their lives according to truth. And you see, all of these things were, were planned by David. He gathered all the men together, 30,000 of them. They had gathered all together and they said, what do you guys think is a good idea? Good idea. And everyone's in agreement. And, and then now they go to do this thing. And here on the, on the path, the ox trips, Uzzah dies. And David's embarrassed. You know, David just shamed. Dave, David's like, you know, I, well, what, I, I'm trying to do the right thing. And, you know, this happens. You know, what, what, what a tragedy. And then at that, it says that David feared the Lord. And I, I think there, there's, there's something good about that. There should be a fear of the Lord in all of our lives. There should, you should, there should be this reverence that, that we serve a holy God. And there should be a fear when we do something that's, that's outside of what his design was, outside of his commands, everything that he declares, you know, should cause us to fear because you see the consequences of those things. You go, man, I don't ever want to put my life in a position that I, I, I would be, you know, judged by God or corrected by God. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. And David that day, I, I think he rethunk everything. You know, you, you know when, when you just kind of, you know, what, what, did, what did I do? How did I get here? You know, I was trying to do the right thing, and here I am, you know, everything's all messed up. I can tell you how many times over the years I've talked to someone who once was walking with the Lord, and, you know, they were once following the Lord, and they've told me, well, you know, I tried that once. It didn't really work for me. And my... my question always to them is, did you try it God's way? <laughs> or did you try it your way? Because if you try it your way, you're going to always end up in that same place where you're disappointed or discouraged, or you're kind of walking around going, you know, I tried it, but, you know, it didn't really work. Or I tried it, it didn't really help me. I tried it, and God didn't really hear me. And, you know, because we're looking at it from our, our view rather than his view. We're trying to do it our way rather than his way. And David, at this point, is going to walk away. He's going to send the ark back. It's going to go back. It's going to stay in that location. And it's going to go into someone else's house. 
He's thinking, I, I, you know, I gave it my best shot. I tried, you know, someone got hurt on the path. It wasn't, it didn't work. It's not worth it. And how, how many people along the way f- fall into that same trap? Because we weren't willing to surrender our will or our way and say, God, I, I, I don't want to do this my way anymore. My way's never worked. My way's always failed me. Every time I try it my way, I end up, you know, f- worse off than, than, I, than I started. I, I, I need to do this the way you prescribe what you say. And David here, it tells us there in verse 11, what, what's this? Verse 10 and 11, it says, So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. Check this out. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. Can you imagine? They, you know, it just happened to be in front of your house that the ark, the ark tripped and Uzzah dies. And they said, hey, we need somewhere to put this thing. <laughs> can, can you store it in your house? You know, yeah, bring it to my living room. And there it, is, there, there it is in Obed-Edom's living room. Every, every morning he gets up, you know, the presence of the Lord is there. His house is prospering. It's being blessed. And o- o- Obed-Edom just, you know, is, is taking in all of God's presence, all of God's blessings upon his life. And, and, and as he's there, it was evident it was evident to everybody that something's happened to the household of Obed-Edom. God's blessing him. God's providing for him. God's taking care of him. I mean, there's a joy, there's a peace, there's a different life that Obed-Edom has because now here's the, the ark of God. The, the, the Lord of hosts is, is now living, you know, right here in, in my living room. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what an incredible thing that was. Word gets back all the way to David. Man, Obed Edom, that, that guy is being blessed. And David, I, I, I can just imagine what David went through at that point. You know, wait a second. How, how come, how come, you know, he's being blessed and we're trying to move the ark and, you know, people die. You know, what's up with that? And I, I think it caused David. I think it caused him to seek out the Lord. I think it caused him to go, wait, wait, wait a second. Maybe this wasn't something that, that God did wrong. Maybe it was something that I did wrong. I'm going to ask you to go back to First Chronicles, this time to chapter 15. Just incredible insight here. Look, look, look at First Chronicles chapter 15. Look at verse 1. David built houses for himself in the city of David. He prepared a place for the ark of God and he pitched a tent for it. And David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before them, before him forever. Did did you guys pick that up? David now understands what happened wrong. We were never to put it on a cart. The Levites were the ones who were supposed to carry it. And they were supposed to carry it on a pole like Moses prescribed it, as God prescribed it to Moses. He says, this is what we need to do. And, and it tells us that he goes and he assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites, the priests and the Levites, and he gathers them together. Now he's not going to the 30,000 leaders any longer. He's going to the Levites now. J- j- jump down to verse to verse 12. Because he just names a bunch of names in those next verses. And I'm not even going to try it. Okay. Look at verse 12. And he said to them, You are the heads of the father's houses, the Levites. Sanctify yourself, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I prepared for it. Check this out. Verse 13. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. Isn't that cool? 
It, 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 it's David acknowledging that what we did last time wasn't the way God designed it. Not the way God prescribed it. And so David goes and, and he's, you know, searching out the scriptures. He's going and saying, well, you know, how are you supposed to move the ark? I mean, what, what, was, what was God's uh, desire when it comes to this, this thing? And so he finds out that the Levites were supposed to carry it. He finds out they're supposed to do it on a pole. And then he acknowledges this is why we had the tragedy happen last time. Because we didn't do it the way God designed. And I, I think that lesson, guys, ha has to be something that, that, you know, all of us take to heart. We, we, we can try to use new carts to do good things, but it, it, it's not going to accomplish what God intended it to do unless we do it God's way. We, we can go and put lights and smoke machines and we can, you know, go and, and try to be as friendly as we can. We, we can try to entice the world to come to know Jesus. But if we're going to try to do it in our fashion, in our way, it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna produce what it was intended to produce. It's gotta be God's way. The new carts might be nice, but it, it was never intended for that purpose. And so he tells them, Look at verse 14, man. I, 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 love, I love this section because watch what he does here. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles. Watch this. As Moses had commanded according to the word of of the Lord. Here's, here, here's what we can conclude from, from that passage. Is that David now realizes that I, I can't do things even though they have a good intention. They might have a, a right motive according to what seems right to me. I, I, I got to do things according to what God declares is right. And so at this point, David has them do this work of ministry, this moving of the ark of the Lord according to God's prescribed way of doing it. And now David's going to be blessed by it. This nation of Israel is going to be blessed by it. And then you turn around and you look in a mirror and you go, wait a second, have I been living my, way, my life the way God prescribed me to live it? Because if I'm not, no wonder I'm in the mess that I'm in. No wonder I, I, I've made all the decisions that I've made that they seem right at the moment, but I never sought God's wisdom, God's counsel, God's direction. And I think that's why God gave us his word. It's why God laid out for us truth so that you and I can come and say, wait a second, this is what right is. It's not what I think right is. It doesn't matter what I feel right is. It doesn't matter what God says is right. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, incred incredible passage. Watch, watch what, what Paul says to this young pastor, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 6, 16. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture was inspired by God. What did, what did he inspire it for? So that you and I can know what doctrine is, Doctrine is just simply knowing, uh, you know, the things that God's declared about himself, about, about us, about salvation, about eternity. You and I can know doctrine because you and I have the scriptures. But it's not just for doctrine, it's to, to, for reproof. It's, it's so that you can go and, and line up the word of God and then line up any situation that you face in life and go, wait a second, this is what's right is. That, that, that's what being reproofed is. 
And it's there to correct you as well. When you're going down the wrong path, man, that you have the word of God to go, wait a second, I've been doing it this way, but God said that's the wrong way. And now you can be corrected so that you have a right understanding, a right truth. When it comes to marriage, when it comes to raising your children, when it comes to, you know, how you live your life in, 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 in every arena. It's there to correct us. And if we're open to be corrected, man, God, God will blow your mind because now you're going to line yourself up in, in the direction that it's supposed to go. Not that you're not going to have any of the consequences that you've already sowed. But, but now you, you, can, you can start new. You, you, you know, you, from this day forward, man, I, I'm going to do the things that, that God declares are right so that I'm sowing the right things into my life. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. You, you, you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life. And the things that you're sowing, are, 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 they, are they sowing, you know, according to truth? Are you sowing them, you know, according to your own will, your own plan, your own desire? And God's able to correct us with his word. And I love this, to instruct us in righteousness. To teach us how to be, instead of having to be corrected, you, you learn how to be righteous. You learn what God declares for your marriage. What God declares in those arenas of your life that, that that we, we've kind of blocked God out of. How, how am I to live my life when it comes to my private life? When it comes to being a, a dad or it comes to being a mom. See, God gives us all the instructions to do it. He's declared those things so that we don't have to be like Uzzah. You know, we don't, we don't have to experience God's judgment, God's wrath, God's anger. We don't have to go that route. And, and it's, it's amazing because it says that he's given us these things that we may be complete. That, that word complete means that, that, you know, we would be perfected. So that we're accomplishing what God designed us to accomplish. That you would finish your race. You, 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 you would, you know, accomplish your purpose. And then I love this, that you be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, God's word will equip you to do his work, to accomplish his purposes. It's an amazing thing. You see, guys, you and I have God's declaration. You know, I, I love that, that David went back all the way to Moses. You know, that at this point, you know, hundreds of years. He goes all the way back to Moses. And he starts to look up how was the ark supposed to be transported? How was the ark supposed to be, you know, dealt with? And he finds it as he's reading through the book of Moses. And then he says, hey, Levites, you're the guys that are supposed to be doing this. Get over here sanctify yourself, you know, set yourself apart, repent of anything that's going on in your life, and then now you can now carry the ark and we can get it to where it needs to go. And that's what the word of God does in every generation. Whether, whether, whether it's, you know, thousands of years down the road or whether it's hundreds of years down the road, you see God's word's able to give us the instructions that we need because it, 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 this isn't man's word. I, I can't tell how many times, well, that was written by man. No, it was written by holy men that were moved by the Holy Spirit to write it, but it was, the revelation came from God. The inspiration came from God. He inspired these men to write these things. So that you and I would have his instructions so that we, we, we would be without excuse. You know, you want to know God's will? Start reading his word. You want to know God's plan for your life? Open up your Bible every day. Start putting it into your heart because those are the things that are going to give you wisdom so that it's able to navigate for you through life. And, and, and David at this point, man, incredible. 
that, that he was seeking the word of God. And, and then as he seeks the word of God, you know, God, um, you know, gives him the, the revelation, the inspiration. He was able to, you know, show him the things that, that uh, needed to happen. And then David follows the, the, that plan. I love, I love it. I, I love how God's word is so pertinent, man, to everything you and I are going through today. Your life, my life, it, 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 you know, it, it's not some archaic book. It's a book that's able to give you the wisdom you need to live your life now. I, I love Hebrews 4.12. The word, of the, the word of God is living and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the moral. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word, it, it goes down even to your thoughts and even to the intents of your heart and it reveals them. That's why the word of God, man, is able to read your mail, to know what you're going through. You know, it, you know God's word is powerful. And David, you know, now coming under its authority, under its rule, Watch this. Look at verse 13. Let's get through the chapter. Look at verse 13. Actually, verse 12. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom, all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and he brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Now, six paces, about, about, about 30, 30 feet, I believe it was, 30 yards. You know, it, it was a short distance. Six paces. They, I think David's going, look, this is the right way to do it. And then they go and take some oxen and they get some sheep. You know, they, they make a sacrifice right there. David's excited because now he's doing it the way God designed it. And then notice what happens in the next verse. Now David and all the house of Israel. I'm sorry, verse 14. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. Now that's going to become important here in a second. A linen ephod is what the Levites would wear. It, 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 was, it wasn't kingly robe. It, was, it wasn't, you know, all of the, the, the purple and all of the, you know, his, his, his majesty. He wasn't declaring all of that. He, he was just going, man, I just, I'm just worshiping the Lord just like you guys are worshiping the Lord. So he puts on the ephod, the linen ephod. And David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet and all as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Remember, Michael, she was Saul's daughter. She, was, she came from a kingly line. And in, in, in her mind, you know, how could David be so undignified? I mean, he's wearing the linen ephod. He's out there dancing, you know, and everyone's watching him. And, you know, he's, he's looking like a, like a commoner. But David didn't care. You see, David was going to worship the Lord. He was going to worship the Lord with all of his heart. You guys, what, what an incredible picture for us. Here, here's the king of Israel. And he's dancing to the Lord. Just kind of leading the procession, worshiping God, acknowledging that, that, you know, God heard him, that God has blessed him, and that now the ark of God, the presence of God was coming into the city. I mean, you know, he's just ecstatic. And there's Michael. She looks out the window. She sees David dancing out there. You know, who's that, who's that fool over there dancing around, you know, doing cartwheels? And she goes, wait a second, that's David. It's the king. That's my husband. And it says at that moment, she despised him in her heart. It was below her. It was below her to, you know, to, to not only worship the Lord in that fashion, but for her husband to worship the Lord in that fashion. And, and this, this is what I loved about David. David had no shame about his worship of God. And think, think about how, how many times we, we're, we're conscious about how people are looking at us. Or people are, you know, do I lift my hand up? Do I not lift my hand up? I mean, what are people going to think? Who cares? 
what people think. If I'm, you're worshiping the Lord, worship the Lord. No, you know, you don't want to be a distraction. So don't, don't start running up the aisles and getting weird. Just worship the Lord, right? I mean, this here is something that, that David's prescribing because they're, they're bringing in God's presence into the city, right? And, and he, he just, he's ecstatic about it. He doesn't care what anybody else thinks, what anybody else says. He's, he's wearing the same clothing that, that, the, that the Levites and everyone that's in the, in the processions wearing. And then check this out. So they brought the ark of the Lord, set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. He blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he distributed among all of the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, uh, women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed and everyone to his house. And, you know, it was just a, a celebration. They, they, they were, you know, now just, you know, having a time of feasting and a time of, of rejoicing and a time of, you know, great fiesta because of what had taken place in Israel. And to be in that, in that place where we're just going, God, I, I, just, I just want your presence. I, 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 there's nothing I long more. The greatest joy that I can find in my life is that your presence is with me. Because God doesn't live in a tabernacle. God doesn't live in, a, in an ark any longer. He lives inside of us. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, you're, you're the one that he dwells in. And it should cause joy in our hearts. It should cause us to rejoice should cause us to, to be, you know, ecstatic about, you know, God and his love and his grace and, you know, and, and then his holiness and that it would cause us to be holy as well. But then notice, notice what happens. And David had finished offering his burnt offerings and peace offerings. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 20. I went backwards too far. Verse 20. And David returned to bless his household. He goes back home and he wants to bless his house now. You know, look, look at God's doing. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. And she said, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servant, the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows and shamelessly uncovering himself. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all of his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord and I will even be more indignified than this. And I will be humble in my own sight. I love it. He goes, you, you, you think that was something? Wait, wait, you know, I, I, I'll even go further than that. Because I, I, I want to I serve God with all of my heart. I'm not here to impress men. I'm, I'm, I'm here to worship God. I, I could care less what anyone thinks of me. I don't, I don't really, you know, that, that's, that's not what I'm living my life for is what man thinks about me. I'm living my life for what does God look upon when he sees me. And that's an incredible heart that David had. And, and I, I, I love this. I will humble, I will be humble in my own sight. I mean, what, was, what was Saul's, issue his pride Saul's issue is that he, he wasn't going to obey the word of the Lord because he wanted to do things his way and David in, on the other hand even though he had you know veered off and in, 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 for, for a moment here doing things his way he acknowledged you know what it, it was because I did wrong it wasn't because God didn't bless and he humbles himself and he worships the Lord he humbles himself and he says, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm nothing, man. Everything I am is because God is the one who put me here. God's the one who established me. God's the one who's blessed me. And I, I want to honor God with my life. And I think we get an insight into the heart of David. That here's a man who had a great desire to live his life according to God's word. 
He was a man who, who, who wanted to worship the Lord. You know, think, think about all these lambs and ox. He's bringing them and he's just offering them to the Lord. That was worship. And he's dancing. His, his worship. We know that he was seeking God's word for counsel, you know, at, at, at that point. You know, so, so you, you think about all the things that David is doing. It, it, it's, it's, the, it's the very foundation for the man who's going to seek after God, the woman who's going to seek after God. Someone who's in the word of God. Someone who, who, who's, you know, worshiping the Lord. Sacrificing to the Lord. And, and, and David becomes an incredible picture here. You, you, look, it, it's interesting. This is that last verse. We'll, we'll close at this point. Look at verse 22. But as for the maidservant of whom you have spoken by them, I will be held in honor. He goes, you know what? God's going to honor me. And because God's going to honor me, the, you know, the people honor me because they see that I, I'm, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for the Lord. And then I love it. Look at this. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. You see, th th this is the woman that, that wasn't going to partake in the blessings because she despised the humility, the worship that David represented. And so she, she, she you know, in, in, in Israel and in that culture, man, if you didn't bear a child, you were cursed. So that, that, in that culture, it, it, it was kind of like one of, one of the worst things that could ever happen to a woman is that she's not able to bear a child. And, and it says that Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children because she didn't experience the fruitfulness of God and the blessings of God because she despised those who worshipped him. And I think there, there's, there's, there's an incredible picture for all of us, guys. May God help us, man, to be, you know, those who humble ourselves, seeking out his word, worshiping him with everything we got.